Welcome to another semester of Explore the World, the International Education Office's virtual speaker series. I'm Jeanette Jasperson, Coordinator of International Education, and it's my pleasure to be today's moderator. We are recording this session, and the video will be posted to the college's YouTube channel. So if you're uncomfortable with that, uh, please take appropriate action now. And welcome to all of you who are still logging in and to those who are already here. We're glad you've joined us. The US Department of State still urges Americans to reconsider travel or not to travel at all to most of the world. Currently, the US government does approve, I just checked this morning, of travel to a few places, including India, Angola, Zambia, and Czech Republic. So if that's your destination, make your travel plans now really quick before the advisory level changes. Um, if you would, everybody would mute themselves, we would appreciate that. We are recording, so um, thanks for that. For those of you who are hoping to explore countries not on that list, it's wonderful to be able to virtually travel with experienced faculty travelers. This fall's Explore the World series will focus on study abroad destinations to which our faculty are ready to take students just as soon as those travel advisories improve. Today, we're going to focus on Iceland and the Andalusia region of Spain. If you have questions for the speakers, please type them into the chat at any time and they will answer them at the end. So first up, Iceland. Professor Jay Antle serves as the executive director of JCCC Center for Sustainability. He also teaches history, including courses in Kansas history and North American environmental history. Jay has traveled to Iceland a couple of times, including a trip just a few months ago in summer 2021. So please join me in welcoming Jay to explore the world, virtual clapping. All right, well, thanks for the uh, opportunity to uh, talk about Iceland here. And um, what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, particularly the topic of sustainability in Iceland, which is why I went back to Iceland in uh, July of this year, and I actually was able to get in during a co sort of a COVID window uh, where I was able to uh, be in Iceland with only, uh, only vaccination and it didn't require an extra test to get in, which is currently what they have as a restriction. And then, of course, I had to get a, a rapid test before I came back, but the government of Iceland made that process remarkably easy. Uh, the intention here is that, uh, is that I will be uh, co-leading a trip to Iceland to study both sustainability and geology this upcoming summer, the summer of 2022, assuming that uh, the State Department allows us to go, or should I say at the college, uh, decides to allow us to go, regardless of what the State Department says. So uh, we'll see how all, that, how all that plays out. So this is Iceland, uh, and this is a map that shows uh, small images of many of the more popular tourist attractions in Iceland. And some of you, if you've uh, attended previous webinars put on by International Education, you may have heard me talk about a few of these places before. But uh, this time I went back with a very kind of targeted agenda. Uh, to see what places could I go where students could both think about sustainability broadly defined um, uh, and how Iceland can show us some examples of how perhaps to or not to do things, and as well as some places that we are going to be losing, uh, places that are not going to be there a century from now because of climate change. So uh, I think Iceland allows us to do all of those things in one relatively small place the size of West Virginia. When you land at Keflavik, you see uh, this poster on the wall, Together for Sustainability, talking about the global goals. And what these global goals are, are the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, there are se uh, over 17-ish, maybe a few more now, goals, which deal with trying to create a, a world in which people have dignity and a standard of living um, that is equitable and one the planet can sustain. So it's interesting to, to go to a foreign country and see this being uh, you know, one of the first things you see when you land. And if you look at the ways uh, several uh, different systems like energy and waste are set up in Iceland, you can see they're well on their way to making these, uh, these 
statements into a kind of reality. Uh, here's one reason why Iceland's very interesting to me from a sustainability perspective, and that is the availability of geothermal energy. And that has to do because Iceland is where the European and American tectonic plates meet and collide. And along that collision zone, you have lots of uh, geothermal activity, including volcanic eruptions like we're currently having on the Reykjanes Peninsula, which is down here in uh, this corner of, of Iceland. And so uh, I'll be showing you a couple of places today that are in the so-called volcanic zone. That's where we have some of the more uh, intensive uses of geothermal energy. And then also, uh, I'll show you some greenhouses which take advantage of slightly uh, lower temperature wa uh, geothermally heated water near the near through view. And then we'll talk a little about glaciers too, and how glaciers are melting in Iceland, like they are in other parts of the, the world. We are losing the planet's cryosphere, and that's something that I really want students to see before it's gone. Uh, Iceland, of course, is well known for other beautiful things, these kind of austere churches and these fantastic landscapes. Uh, you know, photographs like this, uh, that photograph down at the bottom is still one of my favorite photographs, even though it's a lousy cell phone pic. But it's just an amazingly beautiful uh, church on the uh, Snaefellness Peninsula. Uh, here is uh, Kirkusfell, one of the more famous mountains in Iceland, which is also on the Snaefellness. Uh, all the various lava flows over time have left these amazing formations both inland and on the coast. And so Iceland's one of these places where you really have to occasionally rehinge your jaw because it drops open so often because of just the beauty of the scenery you encounter. Waterfalls everywhere, absolutely gorgeous. Uh, beautiful fjords uh, like this uh, all over the, uh, the coastline of Iceland. And I got to actually see geothermal activity uh, up live, uh, live and uh, uh, personal here. This is the uh, volcano that's currently erupting in the Reykjavik Peninsula, a lousy cell phone shot of mine. But I call it my volcano because it began erupting on March 19th, which is my birthday. And uh, so then I got to go to Iceland and it uh, woke up from a three day dormancy period the morning I arrived. And I got to go out and literally three hours from arriving in the country, I got to watch a volcano erupt. It was pretty amazing. And my hope is that the volcano may still be active if we're able to take students there this upcoming upcoming uh, summer. And again, Lynn Beatty would be my uh, co-conspirator. She's going to be doing the geology stuff. But in terms of what you see around Iceland, it has to do with sustainability broadly defined. In this country, you occasionally hear about green roofs, how they uh, pr provide insulation as well as uh, reduce stormwater runoff. Uh, in Iceland, you find uh, they have the original green roofs. Uh, uh, turf houses, turf roofs are pretty commonplace in Iceland and have been since uh, you have Europeans arriving in the 12th century. Here's a modern version of that. And here's a reconstruction of a 12th century Viking longhouse. And so you find these structures all over Iceland uh, that use turf uh, for you know, insulation purposes on roofs. It's really kind of interesting. Now, here's an example of, a, of how an entire system is designed in a very different way than we have here in the United States. So um, that's the biggest coffee cup I could find. Uh, you see there in my photograph. And being someone who really liked big cups of coffee, uh, that was kind of frustrating. Uh, but that's because in Iceland, uh, they expect you to be carrying into places your own refillable mug. And so uh, they have very small um, cups like this. And uh, they actually, at most gas stations, don't have trash cans outside. Uh, they don't have trash cans by the side of the road. They have recycling containers. So if you're used to going from uh, gas station to gas station in the United States and buying a whole bunch of disposable stuff and throw it away at the next gas station, you're going to have issues uh, because that's just the way things are set up in Iceland. It's, these systems are set up deliberately to frustrate the ability to throw things away. Uh, although I will say it took me a while to figure out how to work this system so I didn't uh, drive the ring road uh, without uh, the appropriate levels of caffeine to make sure I was a safe driver. Uh, in Iceland, you can see some pretty amazing uh, geology, including a couple of places where uh, the uh, European and American tectonic plates literally meet in rifts like this. On the left, uh, that is in uh, Thingladir um, National Park. Uh, on the right, that's actually on the Reykjavik Peninsula, not too far from the volcano I showed you. 
where you can literally walk across a bridge from one continent to the other. And so well, when you go to Iceland, these really kind of extraordinary uh, examples of geology at play are, are available to you. Uh, because of the, uh, the way the geology has worked out has left behind a, a kind of uh, a differentiation between the, the highlands of, of Iceland where lots of snow falls and then uh, the lowlands near the coast. And so you have these spectacular waterfalls all over Iceland. Uh, on the left, you have um, the second tallest uh, waterfall uh, in Iceland called Hyfoss. On the right, you have a waterfall you can walk behind called Stalindrafoss, which is near the, the Ring Road. But for the purpose of sustainability, what this means is you have the availability of kinetic energy to be harnessed for hydroelectric power at larger uh, waterfalls. Now, uh, this is there's no geo, there's no dam here, thankfully, for the beauty of this is called Gullfoss. But you can see that some of these larger rivers, as they come off the highlands, there's a lot of energy being produced as they fall over these discontinuities. And in the Iceland right now, roughly 70-ish uh, percent of the energy in Iceland is produced from hydroelectric power and hydroelectric dams, which uh, then gets sent all around the country uh, on these large scale transmission lines. So the electricity mix in Iceland is 70% hydroelectric, 30% geothermal. And I'll show you how that geothermal electricity is produced a bit later on. This produces some really uh, abundant and fairly inexpensive uh, electricity in Iceland, which sometimes leads to some kind of strange things. For example, uh, crypto mining is a big thing in Iceland because of relatively inexpensive electricity and renewable electricity. So uh, that's something which you have, to, you have to be careful sometimes. If energy is too inexpensive, you sometimes have people use an awful lot of it. And then that creates an ethical question that I want my students to think about is, is that even a problem? Is it, if the energy is renewable, does it matter how much you use, right? That's an interesting question for students to play around with. Here's an example of that. So this is one of uh, eight large uh, geothermally uh, heated and uh, powered greenhouses near the town of Fludir. Uh, it's run by the uh, Friedheimer family. And these greenhouses, these eight greenhouses, grow approximately 40% of all the tomatoes eaten in the entire country of Iceland. And they have a restaurant in the interior of one of these greenhouses where you go in and literally you're eating and you pull basil off the vine next to your table and put it into your tomato soup that was made for tomatoes picked that morning from vines in the same greenhouse. So uh, these greenhouses again are heated from uh, geothermally uh, heated water that comes out of the ground fairly close to where the greenhouse is. And the electricity comes uh, from geothermally uh, powered turbines which turn that uh, steam into ultimately electricity. And uh, this is another example of what to do with food waste too. Uh, th these greenhouses uh, generated lots of tomatoes that were too ugly to be sold to restaurants. And so what they decided to do was turn that the, uh, the ugly fruit, quote unquote, into tomato soup, which then became the main course in this restaurant, which now serves 300,000 people a year. So there's a, a great example of turning waste into productive food. Uh, and there's the tomato soup buffet there on the left and on the right, you can see some of the vines where the tomatoes are being grown. This will be something we'll tour hopefully this summer. Uh, so beyond looking at what they're doing in Iceland in terms of energy and innovative uses for agriculture and greenhouse technology, I also very much want to take students to places that are not going to be there for their grandchildren to see. And uh, I mean, particularly easily accessible glaciers. There are a few places in the world where glaciers are as accessible as they are on the south coast of Iceland. Uh, the photographs you see here show the, uh, the retreat of the uh, Solheim uh, Jokel uh, Glacier, which is on the south coast of Iceland. And uh, what's left now, and I'll show you a photograph of, uh, of it in a second. Are the, they have a big lagoon where the meltwater is collecting and you have these kind of semi-icebergs. And then you have, uh, actually I guess I don't have a picture of Solheim Jokel here, but what I have here is a picture of Vatna Jokel, uh, which is uh, the largest glacier in Europe. 
And it also has its own glacial lagoon that you see there in the foreground. My intention is that we'll take students to go out on this lagoon and get a very close look at this, uh, the leading edge of this glacier, which then goes back far into the interior of Iceland, which you see there in the background, up into the high. Uh, examples of what these sort of icebergs look like as they calf off the glacier and then make their way out the glacial lagoon ultimately to the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, the photographs you just saw were of this glacial front here uh, in this glacial lagoon, as they call it. These lines show you how all, the Batna Jokal has retreated from 1890 to 2018, and the 2021 line would be about here. So the acceleration is continuing and is accelerating. Uh, it's, it's pretty remarkable. And when you talk to the guides there that uh, drive the boats onto the lagoons, they'll tell you about uh, that, that for them, climate change happens on a daily basis. So these are the kind of places that I want to take students so that they'll be able to bear witness to what we're going to lose, no matter what we do in terms of trying to slow climate change, certain things already unfortunately pretty much baked in because of the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere and the heating that's going to result. Uh, here's what happens to some of those little icebergs as they make their way into the Atlantic. Uh, I like this photograph, it reminds me of a duck. Uh, this is what's called, near what's called Diamond Beach, where these chunks of ice come out of the lagoons into the Atlantic and they get washed back onto the beach uh, by, by the tides. So here's an example of uh, how Iceland is using geothermal power for the good. This is the Helles Heidi geothermal power plant, the largest uh, geothermal electric plant in the world. And they have uh, just opened uh, last week, they just fired up their new carbon sequestration unit that you might have read about in the news. It's not an enormous carbon sequestration unit, but it does take CO2 out of the atmosphere with the intention of permanently putting that CO2 underground. Uh, it's not going to be nearly a, enough of a scale to make a difference in terms of the issues we face, but it is one of the first large scale applications of a technology that we may need if we want to keep CO2 emissions and global temperatures manageable. So students would go and tour this. All the steam you see here, of course, has to do with you know, all the geothermal, uh, the, the water being heated by the uh, lava underneath the soil that's creating all the heat and that steam's being released as it's being tapped into by this plant. Uh, more examples of the infrastructure. Here you see one of the turbines that's actually uh, being powered by all of this, all the steam, which then converts that steam into electricity, which has been shipped out all over Iceland. Here we see an example of some of the pipes that take that hot water out of the ground and ship it to the Reykjavik, the capital region. And uh, you lined up all the pipes that take that hot water to and from Reykjavik, uh, you would have a pipe that would go from Reykjavik to Italy. So to be clear, even when we're talking about sustainable energy, there are still environmental costs. You got to make the pipes. There are there is no free lunch. Here. So when I, I occasionally get amused when people say, "Oh, you know those wind turbines, you know they're made of steel," you know that, right? Yeah, uh, there is no free lunch, and so anyone who tries to sell you on any kind of energy that has no impact at all is trying to sell you something. The question is, what kind of impact do you want to have? I don't have a photograph of the, the aquaculture stuff that I want to show uh, students in Iceland, uh, but here's an example of like, you know, what you would see in fishing villages, you know, over centuries in Iceland, um, you know, dr the drying of fish and uh, the rem remnants of fish skeletons. But Iceland is becoming a, a place where fish farming is really important, aquaculture, both offshore and onshore. As uh, populations around the world go up and there needs to be a supply of sustainable seafood, well, how do you do that? In Iceland, you have both offshore fish farming and onshore fish farming, and those two interests are actually at loggerheads, which is something that I want students to think about. Um, offshore uh, fish farming, big nets and fjords, uh, oftentimes use species that are not necessarily native uh, to the waters around Iceland. And there's concern that when those nets break, you're going to have the loss of native species as these, as these non-natives get out and mix with native fish. 
So those folks who are running the onshore operations in large tanks uh, believe their operations are going to be superior because they won't have any threat to the native fish because their fish aren't going to get out because they're in large tanks inland that can be operated because of all the cheap power available. In ice. So that's an, an issue that I want students to think about too. And we'll, we'll visit one of the fish farms uh, as part of our trip. So that in a nutshell is uh, some, some snippets of what's happening in Iceland with sustainability, a few things that I saw when I was there. And I believe I have uh, exactly hit 20 minutes. Uh, so with that, I have followed the orders I was given and uh, I will now stop sharing my screen. Well, thanks so much, Jay. Um, I know I have some questions, but if any of you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Jay will address them at the end. Um, certainly climate change and how that's impacting us is a very, very important topic, uh, especially for the students on this call, because you all are the ones inheriting the future. Our next speaker is um, Melanie Bevel Hall. She teaches history and humanities. Several years ago, Melody co-led a study abroad trip focusing on ancient treasures from Egypt and Mesopotamia, and they are housed in museums in Britain and Germany. Her current focus is on studying the three cultures of Andalusia in Spain. On a cold, wintry day a couple of years ago, I sat and looked through photos of Andalusia in preparation for marketing this trip. And I will not forget just the longing that seized me to go visit that inviting place as I watched the snow pile up in Kansas. Melanie, welcome to Explore the World. Thank you. Let me share my screen here. Okay, yeah, like Jeanette said, um, we were supposed to lead a study trip to Andalusia, to, to Spain. Um, and literally the day we were supposed to fly out was the last day we were on campus before the shutdown. So it, luckily we had um, canceled our trip watching everything, um, but hope to sometime in the future um, lead this trip. So Jay's focusing on the future in Iceland. We are looking to the past in Spain. Um, what we can learn from the past to, um, you know, help our present. So Spain has a really interesting history. Um, if you look at the little map in the corner, you can see the Umayyad Caliphate, um, Muslim Caliphate that incorporated most of the Middle East and Spain. And Muslim rule began in Spain in 711. Um, and parts of it remained under Muslim control until 1492. So it has a 700 plus year history of um, being under Muslim rule. And it's a very diverse population or it had a very diverse population with Arabs and Berbers and Jews and Christians and Muslims all living together. <clears throat> so the focus of our trip was to look at these three cultures, Muslims, Christians, and Jews, how they live together and created that golden age of Spain, um, that uh, time in history of intellectual development and sharing um, historically, um, scientifically, architecturally, artists, you know, everything. Um, it was a golden age. The language of Andalusia is, was Arabic. The term Andalusia comes from it's an Arabic term that just means, you know, Muslim Spain. So that was our, what we wanted to look at. Now, the other side of that history is the Reconquista. Um, so on this map, you can see the green arrows showing um, Muslim raids clear up into France, um, which then were repelled. But you can see this dark red area pretty much remained Christian territory while the rest of Spain was under Muslim control. But over time, you start to have the reconquista, the reconquering of Spain by Christian monarchs. And so Leon in, by 1050, um, Castile, 1150, Aragon by 1270, or 1250, 1270. Um, and then finally, Granada falls in 1492. Um, 
So with that, you've got kind of two histories uh, happening. Um, and so while we were trying to explore the golden age of Spain, we definitely saw evidence of the, the Reconquista and the, the effects of that. So I wanted to look at a few cities and see what we can learn about this time. Um, so I'll start with Sevilla. So Sevilla, it was a territory of the Cordoba Emirate. Um, first king of Sevilla was Abdul al Qasim. He declared Sevilla an independent of Cordoba for a while. So um, is it a thriving area? Um, king Alfonso conquers it um, in 1085. So it's um, has a very interesting history. So as we're in Sevilla and we're trying to look at these three cultures and the evidence of the three, um, show you the Real Alcazar, the Royal Palace and the Peralta. And we'll see what evidence remained of these three cultures from you know, the buildings left behind. So uh, La Geralda here on the right is the bell tower of the cathedral there in Sevilla. Now, if you look at it, you can tell right away, it looks like a minaret from a mosque, right? That's because it was. Um, so originally it was the minaret for the mosque. And you're like, wait, that, that mosque or that minaret or that bell tower, it really looks familiar. And it should, because here we go. Here's our Kansas City bell tower on the left, modeled after the La Geralda in Sevilla, because Kansas City and Sevilla are sister cities. So literally, the architects, and when they built the plaza, they modeled it after La Geralda. In fact, the little tiny picture on the bottom, we're driving along in Sevilla. We just landed, and we're like, oh, wait, Avenida de Kansas City. And we were like, there's that connection between Kansas City and Sevilla. But what was even um, more fascinating, after we were in Spain, we went over to Morocco to explore that, see if it tied in. And in um, Marrakesh, the Kotobia Mosque um, is actually the minaret, the original one, um, is like the grandpa of our Kansas City Plaza. Um, so the La Geralda in Sevilla was modeled after this minaret, this mosque in, in Marrakesh. <clears throat> so fun world connections right there. But again, the architecture shows the story. It shows the history of a minaret then changing into um, a Christian bell tower. So what remains, one thing um, I guess to look at as we look at uh, Spain and these three cultures is the question of the Jews, right? They were never in power. So you had Muslims in control, you had Christians in control at different times. Um, the Jews were never in control, right? They're just citizens. And so finding their story is really telling to the whole overall story. So the, the Jews of Sevilla, um, there was the Jewish quarter. They had a thriving community, several synagogues. This map here marked out a lot of areas um, that used to be Jewish synagogues or important Jewish sites. But when you go there today, all that remains, there's this little museum, you can take a walking tour, but nothing remains, it's gone. Um, there's this three crosses here marking a reminder of um, a monument that was set up, reminding of a, a time when 4,000 Jews were persecuted and killed on June 5th of 1391. So all that remains is, is that, that marker of the three crosses. Um, and that's telling too, to have the evidence of the people pretty much wiped out. Um, so like I said, it has this little tiny museum where they are trying to tell the story of the Jews of Spain. And so you have um, inside, you've got paintings like this one, um, introducing you to some of the famous Jews who lived there in Spain. Um, so this man, Todros Ben Yosef Halevi, Abu Lafia, um, he was a rabbi, a Kabbalist, a poet. He lived in the Jewish quarter. He was respected by King Alfonso 
the 10th. In fact, he even traveled with him to France. Um, so a respected man. And then you move on to another picture, another painting. And you have this example of Samuel Abranavel, um, who born in Sevilla, a respected man, um, living in the Jewish quarter, owning prominent, you know, properties. And in, uh, after 1387, his name changes and he's on record as Juan Sanchez, um, where he then continues to work for the king and queen as in their treasury. But his name change shows his, his conversion to Christianity as it became um, <clears throat> a place that was less and less tolerant for, for Jewish people. Um, so it was convert or or not really have opportunities. Um, so let me give you just a little bit of background. Traditionally, um, in Islam, Christians and Jews are respected as people of the book. Um, and so Jews and Christians would need to pay a special tax, a non-Muslim tax, but with that tax, they get special protection from the ruler. So normally you would have like the palace and right near the palace, you'd have the Jewish quarter because the Jews would be under the protection of, of the rulers, right? So let's look at another building and see what evidence we see of these three cultures and uh, what they left behind. So this is the Real Alcazar, the Royal Palace in Sevilla, it was built in 913 by the Caliph of Cordoba. And it was built on Roman ruins. So before Muslims in Sevilla, you had the Romans. And so there's, there's lots of history, layers of history in Sevilla. Um, it's conquered by the Castilians and in 1248 and turns into a royal pal the royal residence there. But just looking in this courtyard, you can see the beautiful Islamic architecture, the geometric patterns, um, the lovely tile work. I mean, you could spend hours and hours and hours just wandering through the grounds here. Um, so in Islamic art, you it's very rare to see images um, because in Islam, the one unforgivable sin is shirk or idolatry, worshiping anything besides the one God. So they often will not have images of people because you don't want to worship a person, you want to only worship God. So in the art and architecture, you will see repeating geometric patterns. Um, sometimes you'll see animals or floral designs. You can see, you know, this um, peacock here and some birds, all reflective of God's creations and God's designs being incorporated into the art or um, the geometric patterns, the, the perfection of God's creations. Um, so all of those kind of meanings, you'll see um, along the edge, I don't know if you can see along this border, the Arabic calligraphy often will have verses of the Quran. So this is all pretty standard for Islamic art, and it's there in the architecture all over Spain. The beautiful gardens. So interestingly enough, though, on your way to the Real Alcazar, you see this little, there's a little, you know, walkway area um, that we were walking through and it said Uteria. So it's, you know, the remnant of the Jewish quarter, there's a little sign there. And so I'm exploring and I find this little courtyard in the Real Alcazar, the Patio de los Levis, the Levi's courtyard. Um, a remnant of the connection with the Jewish quarter there and the palace. So that was kind of fun. Now, um, as the Christian monarchs then take over, um, they don't destroy this beautiful architecture, right? They keep it, it stays. So that does not get wiped out, that remains. And they just intended to build on top of it or add to it. So you'll see, you know, the, the typical Islamic art and architecture, even the Arabic 
calligraphy, and then you will have the Christian motifs added to it. Um, as this Christian monarchy is coming in, you definitely have, you know, the themes, you have the images of the, the Virgin Mary and, and such. The bottom image is showing basically Mary giving her blessing to the Spanish explorers who are going to then go forth and find resources to build up the, you know, the strength and the might and power of Spain. Um, so that all gets connected into the history um, as well, which was very kind of interesting to see coming from, you know, the, the Americas coming <laughs> seeing that, that side of the story. Um, all right, let's go to Cordoba. <clears throat> Cordoba has more remnants of the Jewish culture than Sevilla did. Um, there is the Casa de Sephirad, the house of the Sephirad, the Jewish, Spanish Jews, um, so the house of the Spanish Jews, so a lovely museum right across from a synagogue. We weren't able to go to the synagogue because at the time it was under um, reconstruction. They're they trying to fix it up a bit. But inside there's all these artifacts and remnants of um, Jews who lived there in Cordoba during this golden age. Um, here's a top right corner. You've got the scrolls of Esther that would be read during Purim. Um, in the center here, you can see this beautiful gold embroidered dress, right? This wedding dress. And it was interesting to learn that some things that we look at as Spanish culture, like the beautiful embroidery for like the bullfighters and such, that gold thread and um, that embroidery was actually came from the Jewish artisans. It was their tradition um, that then gets incorporated into Spanish culture. I got Maimonides here, a philosopher. I'll talk about him in a minute, but he's born there in Cordoba um, and very much part of that golden age of uh, learning and philosophy and debate and discussion. And then right, of course, in the museum, you've got the other side of the story um, with this Inquisition outfit, Jews who would be taken on trial and put in these robes, inquisition robes, um, as they go on trial to find out if they are truly converted to Christianity or if they're secretly practicing Judaism. Um, so interesting to see evidences of, of both sides of those, the story, a time when they um, very much were able to thrive and grow and be a part of a community in a time when they were not allowed to be a part of the community. This tile work right here says Shalom in Hebrew. Um, okay, so Maimonides, we've got here at him, a statue of him on the left and on the right, we've got Averroes, um, Ibn Rushd. So you've got a Muslim philosopher, Jewish philosopher, both participating in this golden age, both born in Cordoba, um, Maimonides did have to leave Cordoba, um, ended up in Morocco and then in Egypt and was the physician for Saladin. Um, there's this cool museum right there in Cordoba, right by the Jewish Museum that shows kind of the cool achievements of this time frame. And so this is a, um, a paper press, right? This is a time of intellectual learning. You gotta have paper. So the paper making in a paper press. That was kind of cool to see. But in Cordoba, um, and Cordoba became like the capital for Abel Rahman, who he has an interesting story of basically having to flee Syria when the Abbasids take over uh, the Umayyad Caliphate and continues the Umayyads there in Spain. But Cordoba becomes his capital. So the Mosque of Cordoba, again, it tells a fascinating story um, and beautiful. You can see the beautiful red and white arches there inside the mosque of the brick and the limestone. Um, so in Cordoba, the Muslim and Christian communities, they shared a church and shared the times of worship. So when Abd al-Rahman wants to make it a mosque, they said he bought the church from the Christians 
And the trade-off was then they could go build new churches outside the city walls, but they could, they had permission to build new churches. So he buys the church and builds the mosque and it gets expanded over um, the years. And this is the Qibla that's supposed to mark the direction of prayer, but a beautiful, beautiful mosque. Well, again, this, the building tells an interesting story. Um, with the Reconquista and once the Christian monarchs come in, they don't destroy it, right? This is a beautiful building. You're not going to tear it down. You're not going to destroy it. So it changes into a, a basilica, a, a cathedral there in the middle of the mosque. We've got this Christian cathedral. And along, so I knew that. I knew that, that I would see that, but it was very interesting to actually see in this, this mosque, in the middle of the prayer hall, you have this, this Christian cathedral. And then what I was also surprised to learn was all along the edges, families have built chapels um, for their family to go and worship. You can kind of see one here on the side <clears throat> through the gate bars. And then of course on the outside, the minaret changed into this very interesting looking bell tower. So just kind of fascinating to see what you learn about history from the buildings left behind. Not far from Cordoba is the Medinet al-Zahara, which was um, Abdul Rahman's first capital city, um, palace, et cetera, right outside of Cordoba that he built. And it's now ruined, so it's really fun to have the architectural um, archaeology moment where you go exploring. So that's fun. Okay, last area I want to look at is Granada. I know I'm running out of time, but um, Granada was the last place to fall, right? So it had was under Muslim rule for 700 plus years. Um, the Alhambra right on top of the city or up on a hill overlooking the city. It's gorgeous, 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 gorgeous. Um, again, the beautiful mosaics and architecture. But inside the center of the Alhambra, you find this courtyard, the courtyard of the lions, um, where you have this fountain with 12 lions and the fountain on top. And um, it was actually a gift from the Jewish vizier and poet to the king, given to the king, um, you know, the Muslim king there when Alhambra was being built. So again, fascinating to see these two different religious traditions working together. They are part of the same community, part of the same whole building this beautiful Alhambra. So that was fun to see, but just, just some pictures of Alhambra because it's just gorgeous. The amazing, you know, Islamic architecture, the gardens, so pretty. This was fascinating. So you, I mean, okay, it's just beautiful, but you see these color colors on the wall there. If I was standing right here and I look up to the ceiling, like in this little niche, you would see this. And it's basically a stained glass window. So as the sun's shining through it, it's putting the colors on the wall. So it's just so fun. But of course, Granada Falls, um, from a Muslim perspective, um, to King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella in 1492. And at this point, Spain is united under one um, kingdom, okay? And Ferdinand and Isabella, their goal was to make it one people, one faith, one Spain. And so that's when the, the Spanish Inquisition really begins and Muslims and, Muslims and Jews are kicked out of Spain expelled from Spain, many go to Morocco, many go to um, Istanbul, or the Jews try and convert, and you have inquisitions trying to make sure they're truly Christian. Um, this is, of course, the same year that Columbus gets permission from Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand to then go explore. So interesting to see that connection of uh, this monarchy taking over all of Spain and then wanting to continue to expand their power and influence. So I guess the lessons from Spain, and this is again from that little museum in Sevilla, 
um, or Jews after this time frame having to have proof that yes, we really did convert and you'd have to hold on to this document for centuries proving that your family was Christian and you had been baptized and, and converted or you faced the Inquisition. Um, some crazy things um, to see and learn from. Um, so I guess some of the takeaways for today would be a time in history where Different cultures were able to work together and build together, learn from each other, and a time in history where there was no tolerance, where it was everybody needed to be one, be the same um, religion, ethnicities, language, culture, et cetera. So that was kind of what we were looking at or wanting to look at with our students and explore both of those sides and see what we could learn to apply to our own situation here. Thanks so much, Melanie. It does definitely um, bring up questions about the role of nationalism intersecting with religion. Um, we do have some of those questions in our own culture. We have a few questions for you um, in the chat. One is that since Islam does not, according to this student, have any pictures of a living being, why are there animal sculptures or, you know, in the mosque of Spain? Well, that's a great question. Um, so animals, that would be fine. It's part of God's creation, right? It helps you to appreciate um, God's power and magnitude and his creations. And you're not going to be worshiping, you know, an animal or, you know, flowers or whatever. Um, the challenge or the, the prohibition against images, it's its really with human figures, not wanting to worship a, a person over God. Um, I guess they're not really worried about that with, with animals or flowers and things. So, so it, it kind of more uh, privileges human beings and the creative order rather than making them, rather than a more animistic worldview. That they're, they're more of a reflection of God's creation. So you're still worshiping one God. You wouldn't be tempted to worship, you know, the animal versus worshiping God. Thank you, Jay. Um, the question is, um, are the uh, Icelandic geo and hydro plants government owned or privately owned? And also did the 2008 global financial crisis spur that power development? The situation of ownership in Iceland is pretty tricky, um, kind of complicated. My understanding is that these are privately owned operations, although you have in the past had government utility companies as well as government investment in them. Um, in terms of the 2008 financial crisis, uh, I don't, I'm not aware of there being a particular linkage between that event and these, and for example, the new, the new plant at, at uh, Hellas Heidi. Uh, but there's absolutely no doubt that that particular event led to a wholesale re-regulation of the Icelandic financial industry mm -hmm. in ways that never really quite got going here in the United States. But I, I'm not aware of there being any direct ties between shifts in the way energy is produced or financed in Iceland and that financial crisis. I'm also willing to say, I, I'm not yet an expert on the on that question. Give me a, give me a, another year and maybe I will. All right, we'll hold you to that, Jay. Um, Melanie, there was a question about the sister city connections uh, between Sevilla and Kansas City. Do you know anything about that history? Uh, what was the connection there? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know how that came to be. I know a lot of big cities will have a sister city in a foreign country uh, where they make relations, um, try and send things back and forth and just try and have um, good relations economically, et cetera, um, even traveling back and forth. And I'm not sure how Kansas City and Sevilla became sister cities, I, that's a good thing, good question. I should look into that. I just know that we are, um, and I knew it from our side of it, but it was really fascinating to land in Sevilla and like literally we're on the bus and they're like, Kansas City, you know, a little road showing Kansas City and we drive past this 
Kansas City. Um, so for some reason, these two cities have decided to make uh, a relationship with each other. Thank you. Uh, Jay, I was quite interested in that picture of all the hot water pipes, um, you know, going across the train. Mm -hmm. When I think of pumping out groundwater, you know, my mental model is the Ogallala aquifer. So is there some kind of ground issues, subsidiance, you know, related to that? Uh, no, no, not in Iceland. Um, and I need to... I need to actually try to spend more time figuring out uh, exactly how much that water is recirculated and how and and what and exactly how all that works. Some of it, some of its heat, some of the actual stuff that comes out of the ground is just heat transfer. Uh, some mm -hmm. which in heats water, it's already in too. Some of it is actually taking water out. So mm -hmm. I'm not exactly sure what the percentage of that is. Uh, but no, there are no concerns about. And this is partially because there's plenty of precipitation in Iceland. Uh, you know, you are talking about the high plains. Now, going back to that question about the uh, about ownership, um, I guess I just looked at a quick note of mine, uh, a file I had open, and uh, I'll just say it's complicated because the, the government of Iceland owns substantial amounts of the utility company that runs most of these operations, but it is a public pri private ownership with a really complicated ownership structure. Thank you. And I was also wondering, Jay, this is not Iceland, it's Greenland, but if you wanted to comment at all about the recent rain in Greenland. Uh, sure, it's not supposed to rain in Greenland. And uh, because of warming temperatures in the Arctic, it's, uh, it, there are some places in, Iceland, in Greenland where it rained for the first time in, 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 in history, at least recorded history. Uh, this past summer. And uh, what that, of course, does is then enhance the amount of ice melting that takes place. So it's uh, it's not good at the risk of being Captain Obvious. But no, they're, we're living in a period where the Arctic is undergoing kinds of changes that, is not gone on, that have not gone on in that part of, of the world for hundreds of thousands of years in some places. And uh, so you know, one reason that I want to take students to Iceland and maybe even to Greenland one of these days is again to uh, bear witness to what's happening and to what's ultimately going to be lost. Well, thank you to both of our speakers. As you're thinking about your own upcoming travel, um, Iceland, you can have some interesting discussions on things like cheap electricity and unintended consequences or native species with fish farming and you can see what your grandchildren will not. And of course, when you travel um, with Melanie, just really interesting cultural questions about the relationship between the government and faith. And is it really, can you be, I mean, in order to be one Spain, that they really need to be one people in one faith or uh, just thought provoking issues with relevance to our own day. So thank you all for joining us. Um, this series will return on Wednesday, October 13th, so a couple weeks from now, when we will virtually travel to Belize and Japan. Before then, our colleagues in the International and Immigrant Student Services Office will sponsor a great decisions discussion next week on Thursday afternoon at 2 p.m., also via Zoom. Their topic, um, they expect to discuss the idea of, is globalization over? So you can come think about that. Everybody's welcome. If you need help registering, let me know. But until we meet again, stay healthy, stay safe, and do what you can to explore the world. Thanks so much for coming, and thanks to both of our speakers. We really appreciate your time.